thank you very much, Patricia, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. It's a fairly challenging audience covering many different fields. Just as a matter of interest to calibrate my talk, how many here would call themselves astronomers? <laughs> OK, that's very good. So apologies to them if uh, I'll spend the same fraction of time on technical details. Um, let's just see if I can uh, dim the lights here. I think that's hopefully better. Um, now, I believe I was told by the AV technician that this is being videoed, and therefore, rather than using my finger or a laser beam, I'm supposed to basically use uh, the cursor here because this goes into the, uh, in the video. And um, that's um, the topic, as Patricia already said. My research area is cosmology. That comes from the Greek word cosmos. That is to say the study of the universe. And um, we're going through an interesting phase, although it's a very ancient subject. Just of human knowledge, I mean, mankind was always very fascinated by, by the sky. Uh, the modern cosmology uh, is very exciting. Uh, there are lots of data now coming in. There'll be more in the future. Um, and the picture we see seems more and more puzzling. So if anything, I would like to convey to you the astonishment we have now and that there are more questions than answers. So it's very important to get that picture. Now, I'll give a, an overview of observational cosmology. Um, as the title, title implies, I would like to talk about you know, the two sides of the, of, of, of the subject, which are the light we see and what we don't see. So as a cosmologist, it's a bit like observing a tip of an iceberg. And the question is, what's underneath? And um, it's, it's, the whole subject became more and more exciting over the past decade or so, because now we think or we talk not only about dark matter, which has already been a mystery for a long time, but also about dark energy. So when I was a PhD student in Cambridge and asked my Professors, how come we can discuss universe where we don't understand most of it, dark matter, cold dark matter? The answer was, it's quite all right to assume one component we don't understand. Now I have to tell my students that we should live with two components we don't understand. So if anything, the situation got even more embarrassing. But it makes it obviously more exciting in terms of discovery. So uh, Patricia mentioned I was quite impressed by the, uh, this perfect timing. Uh, that uh, UCL is monitoring very, very carefully the overall uh, calendar. And um, this seems to really coincide with that uh, anniversary when uh, Sir Christopher Wren, uh, who is mainly known, I would say, to the public uh, for his architecture, right, St. Paul's Cathedral and so on, and talking to UCL, one is very careful because he's probably an expert in architecture in the room, but uh, here, we, this is just to remind you ourselves that he was also a distinguished scientist, and at some point he was the civilian uh, uh, professor of astronomy at the University of Oxford. It's a chair which is still uh, there, currently held by my colleague, uh, Professor Joe Silk, um, and before that by another colleague, Professor George Statio. So Christopher Wren was a professor of astronomy, and uh, it turns out that on, um, on that date, now here's the debate, you know, you know, we still you know, don't quite know, but according to the website of the Royal Society, he gave on the 30th of November, 1660, a lecture to a dozen or so men gathered to hear him. He was a young man at the time. You can work out his, his age. Um, and uh, this discussion followed you know, or led to what is called here uh, physico-mathematical experimental learning. It's now sounds a rather archaic title, but this has led to uh, if you like, the world of natural sciences. Um, so in some places, the date is given as 28. You know, we astronomers are quite used to large arrow bars. So <laughs> give or take relative to the age of the universe, I think it's perfect timing, Patricia. And I think we should celebrate that and thank him and thank the Royal Society, some of our 
funding comes from the Royal Society through fellowships. We have uh, a number of fellows uh, from the Royal Society, and I myself hold, in fact, uh, a Wilson Award from them, which also helps my research. So uh, thanks to him and to the Royal Society. Uh, zooming in and, and putting on, on that time scale, so uh, many of you know that uh, this uh, university uh, was found 1826, give or take a year probably. Um, so this is much after the time Christopher Wren established uh, his uh, Royal Society. And um, in our little corner, we can see, uh, usually when I give it uh, abroad, I say that the sky is always blue, but I can't, I can't tell you that, because you know the place. Um, and uh, you can see there's a bit of history of astronomy here, uh, because we can see, oops, we can see actually the dome on the left uh, in, in, the, in the main uh, court. Um, UCL astronomy is quite a broad enter enterprise. There are actually quite a number of departments that run uh, astronomy. Um, we, the astrophysics group, which I'm heading, are, we are part of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, there is another sister department called MSSL, Department of Space and Climate Research. And they, all together, just in our corner, we are, based, by the way, based on the, the Kathleen Lonsdale building on the ground floor. And uh, all together, it's about 90 people or so who occupy desks and think about science and write papers. And we're a very diverse group. Uh, historically, there's been an old tradition in, in this group of uh, doing research in stellar astrophysics, star formation, astrochemistry, uh, atmospheric physics, exoplanets recently. Uh, opt there's an optics laboratory, optical science laboratory, and there's also a teaching observatory. Uh, we talk quite a lot to other departments. We have this Origins Institute within our faculty, which brings together people in different fields. And we have strong links to the uh, MSSL I mentioned earlier, Computer Science Department, and the Maths Department. I moved here in 2004 from Cambridge, as Patricia said, and uh, it was my task, apart from running the group day to day, also to establish cosmology. So this is the rather modern cosmology within UCL. Uh, this is a picture of uh, uh, some of us. This is only the cosmology part of, of, of the astrophysics group. Um, just a, a photo taken, uh, in fact, earlier this month in a familiar site. And uh, you can see at the back, the students and postdocs, there are the really important people. <coughs> I'll get there. I'll get there, thank you. Uh, but it's very important to show where the people who actually do the work. It's not just about equations. Well, come the equations. Uh, students and postdocs at the back and in front, uh, 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 faculty colleagues uh, who are working with me on this. Uh, from left to right is Philippe Abdallah, Hirania Perison, on the right, Sarah Bridal. Um, we have this observatory at Mill Hill. I strongly recommend. It's only two, 10 miles away from here. Uh, Although it's uh, no, not the best site in the world, but one can do quite a lot of uh, observations from there. It's part of our teaching program. And also, uh, recently, a discovery of extrasolar planet uh, was done there. So I recommend it, uh, various open days and open nights. Before I take you to cosmology, people come to this subject from different uh, areas. So just to remind you where we are, we are on planet Earth. Uh, and um, the big change there is we used to think about nine planets, and now it turns out there are only eight, because one of them, Pluto, got demoted as a result of discovery of a few other planets. Um, what's very exciting, uh, until 95, 1995, we only knew about one solar system, our own system, the solar system. And since 95, there's been a major burst of discoveries of planets that go around other stars, extrasolar planets. Um, and uh, this is being detected by a variety of techniques. Uh, on the left, what you can see is the, this effect of do the Doppler effect, where the sun of that system, the star there, wobbles under the influence of the neighboring planet. So we don't see the planet, but we see the star wobbles. And that's how we infer there is a a planet there on the right, it's an artist's impression. And uh, a member of our group, Giovanni Tinetti, actually discovered water on one of those exosolar planets. Very exciting, there are now over 500 of those. 
Um, but going to the bigger scale, we actually live inside a galaxy full of stars, about 10 or 100 billion of, of them. And um, we are inside the galaxy, so that's why it's called, it's called the Milky Way, because when you observe it uh, along the plane of the galaxy, you see that white band of stars and dust on the sky. But if somebody in a different galaxy look at us, and this is another galaxy which looks more or less like our own galaxy, but seen edge on, you can see where the arrow is that um, the sun would be in a relatively unimportant position. So our position in our own galaxy is in a fairly unimportant neighborhood. Um, and a lot is going on. It's good we are not too close to the center because this would be a fairly uh, dramatic place. There's a black hole inside. And it's good we are not too far away because this would be too cold and we want life would not evolve. So we're in a boring neighborhood, but in a good one. Uh, and the galaxies come in many uh, shapes and forms. Um, I, I, I know I recognize some artists in the audience, so just amazing how nature can create this uh, a wonderful piece of art. And um, you can see they come in, in different shapes, spiral galaxies, elliptical galaxies, and so on. And there are many of them. There are actually billions of galaxies. In each of them, there are hundreds of billions of stars. Um, and all that system, the whole universe, is expanding. This is a very simple cartoon of what's actually happening uh, because uh, my little daughter, I showed it to her. This is the slide she liked most. She's about two years old. She liked it, really. Uh, and so I'll show it again. I can see that some people find it interesting. <laughs> but the point here to illustrate that is that um, the people ask, where is the center of expansion, right? So the point is, there's no center. Each point can see itself as a center of expansion. Each of those dots can see it itself as a center. People give the analogy of a, you know, a cake with raisins that's expanding in the oven. And each raisin is getting far away from the other one, or dots on a balloon. Um, in, in, in the picture we have at the moment, if you go from top left to the right, uh, there was, we believe, a big bang. And the slide says 15 billion years ago, we think it was for about 14 now. Uh, there was a big bang, and there were these tiny fluctuations, back then quantum fluctuations, which you see mapped on, to, on that um, over there. You can see those ripples, a bit like little waves in the ocean. And those fluctuations got then amplified further down. and then got projected on the cosmic micro background sky, and then those small seeds created the structure we see today. Okay, so we see an overall expanding universe, but different bits and pieces uh, came together and got amplified under the force of gravity. Now, this is maybe the most significant slide here because this tells you, explains hopefully, the, the title of this talk, that really it seems now and there's a good consensus about it in the community. It seems now that only 4% of the universe is made of the stuff we are made of. So we belong to a minority, as much as we think for us as being important. Not only we are in a boring neighborhood of the galaxy, but actually the stuff we are made of only accounts for 4% of baryonic, what's called baryonic matter, ordinary matter. Um, there's 21, 22% in this cold dark matter. When I was a student, we were told it's 4%, but the green part covered 96%. So the picture was it's baryons and then cold dark matter, which is still hypothetical. We don't know what the dark, cold dark matter is. There are some other examples of dark matter, for example, neutrinos, which we know exists, and I'll show uh, recent uh, results from our group. But otherwise, that's what it is. And then the remaining 74% or so is in the form of dark energy. Uh, so these are these two components we don't quite understand. Now, on the left-hand side, this is the other part of the story. Uh, in understanding cosmology, you have to see what are the ingredients. So that's on the right-hand side. And then you can ask, what is the curvature of the universe? So the whole analysis of cosmology is done within Einstein's general relativity. And in Einstein's theory, uh, uh, the space could, can actually be curved. It need not necessarily be flat like uh, this table. And in his theory, the, the curvature could be spherical or hyperbolic or flat. The, the data we currently have 
uh, from astronomy suggests that the universe is flat, uh, it's accelerating because of this composition, and most of it is unfamiliar. So if you can take that as the main message back home, that we know fairly well now the universe is flat, by that I mean that if I, I shine two laser beams, they'll remain parallel. In a different universe, which is curved, they'll be divergent or convergent. Um, and also that it's accelerating due to that push of the dark energy, and uh, it's really made of stuff we don't know. This is an illustration of that curved space-time in general relativity. We don't say uh, a star has a mass, but we rather say space is curved, space-time is curved where this object is. Uh, so as we like to say, uh, matter tells space how to curve. As a result of it, what we can also see that if there is a real object out there, the distance, uh, it will get the photon trajectory will be such that it will reach the eye from a different location, so we'll see it shifted. That's called bending of light. It's a well-defined prediction of Einstein's relativity. Now, at lunchtime, I was told I should not put any equations, so I decided, nevertheless, there might be some mathematicians here. So it's a very simple mathematics turning Einstein's equations into a very simple equation. And what it is, is expressing what I just said, that in, in general relativity, uh, matter and dark energy tell space how to curve. So what we have here, well, this is just one. Everybody's happy with that, I hope. Uh, here is we have a f the fraction of stuff in the universe in the form of matter. So it's this, whatever I had there, 22% plus 4%, 26%. For now, let's call it a quarter. It's the fraction of at present. And this is the fraction of this dark energy we talked about. And as you can see, if we know the two of them, we can tell the curvature. So as it turns out, the current numbers are such that the curvature is zero, and it's made of, it's influenced by the contribution of matter and this dark energy, which I still haven't told you what it is. Um, now, in order to challenge the mathematicians in, in the audience, I thought I'll do one mathematical operation. So forgive me for that. A very complicated one. I basically move that term from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. Is this okay, Patricia? It's correct. Well, this is actually quite an important illustration of what Einstein's theory tells us. Because when I turn it to put it on the left, it means that this dark energy is not actually energy, but it's just a correction to the curvature. So this mysterious component, either there is something out there, either every centimeter cube in this room has got this dark energy, or space is not exactly flat, as I told you, but it's got a little deviation from it. And that's what we don't know if you look at the literature day to day on the electronic archives. You'll see some papers claim we see dark energy, other papers would say we see curvature. And just for completeness, I put at the bottom actual Einstein's equation. And it's interesting that he actually put lambda, which is this symbol for dark energy, or as he called it, cosmological constant. He actually put it on the left hand side, not on the right hand side. It's interesting. But it's really putting on the left and right changes your whole concept of what it is, however trivial it may seem. Now, I'd also like to talk, it's a quite a diverse audience, so maybe it's good to talk a bit about scientific paradigms. When I was an undergraduate, I was exposed to this famous book by Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolution, where he said that science undergoes periodic paradigm shifts and it's not just progressing in a linear uh, fashion, and um, that this really, um, suddenly there is a discovery that changes the way people think. And it's really, I think, only when I got myself into research dark energy, I could see what Thomas Kuhn actually meant, because I could see how dark energy cosmological was in and out of fashion. I also like very much the third bullet points, that scientific endeavor uh, is very much, very much, is, is not just relies on objectivity, but we must account for subjective perspective as well. And I have plenty of examples, there's no time to tell them, that how the subject is actually affected by sociological and psychological effects. It's not just doing computers, computing. That's why I like to show people uh, uh, 
uh, talk about people, not just about, about the equations. And here are some of the heroes of this. And it says the checker history because this cosmological constant, as Einstein called it, which now got the glorified name dark energy, you know, it sells better, especially when you are trying to get money from the Department of Energy in the US. Uh, it's nicer than cosmological constant. It's a general form, but it's very interesting. Einstein put it there as a way of getting a static universe uh, because his solutions gave either an expanding or contracting universe. He didn't like it. Again, here is your subjectivity example. Why didn't he like it? We don't know. So he said, let's put a constant. Few years later, Hubble showed that the universe is expanding. So Einstein said that this was the biggest blunder of his life. He probably said something like this in German. We don't quite know what he said exactly. And then it was said to be zero. So when I was a student in Cambridge, I was told it's, we know it is zero. And now people think it's not zero. And it has an embarrassing value. Why is it 75%? We don't know. And the actual value, anyhow, is very small compared to some theories from particle physics. It should have been much, much bigger, 10 to the power of 120 bigger, according to some theories of early universe. So that's embarrassing. It's also embarrassing how come we live in a universe where dark matter, dark energy are in similar quantities. So this is all the way from Einstein. The, the two people you see on the right are people of so my academic age. They led two teams that studied supernovae, exploding stars. And in 98, claimed that there is a need for this cosmological constant. Although you can also see already in the literature papers about cosmological constant, including by myself, in the early 90s. Um, I should also mention, because this is a broad audience, which includes historians and uh, people from other disciplines of science, it's quite interesting. Most people would tell you dark energy is 10 years old, you know, 98 or so, 12 years old. I would say, oh, Einstein talked about it. Uh, here is just a, an example that shows that, in fact, Newton actually already suggested, actually, something which g looks like cosmological constant. He, he had this term here, possible term, which goes like force being linear with R. We're all familiar with force, gravity falling off, like 1 over R squared. And Newton also considered, for reasons I don't have to time to explain, a linear force. And his biggest mistake, his biggest mistakes, was not to call the constant lambda over 3 and not to consider superposition. Otherwise, we would have credited him with that. So if you want just to get your intuition what dark energy is, one way of thinking about it is we are used to minus g over r squared. We trust that as the force. That's why apples drop. And when we take an airplane, we trust it. Otherwise, we wouldn't arrive safely. But actually, it does mean in the modern science that in fact the true force also has another repelling force, which goes like distance, except it's so small that it's noticeable only on very large scales. So on the solar system, it's not noticeable. And uh, all the computers that calculate trajectory of airplanes ignore it. It's so small. That's why it's called cosmological constant. It's all quite nice. And Newton was quite excited. It's pro allegedly the only place in the whole of Principia where he expressed emotions by saying he discovered two forces. And in fact, with a master's student, Lucy Calder, we, we wrote an article about it. It appears on my website, if you're interested. We've and also another article about uh, the paradigm shift uh, uh, 20 years ago. So you're welcome to look at that history. So what is dark energy? I kind of told you either there's some sort of energy, which technically is called vacuum energy. And this is parameter W for the physicists in the audience, which is the ratio of pressure to density which in Einstein's theory is just minus one. There is now effort by hundreds of scientists, which would cost billions of dollars or pounds or euros, to actually measure that W. Huge effort to measure that W to see, is there a deviation from Einstein's prediction or something else? There's the possibility of it being all on the right, left-hand side, modified gravity. Or maybe our concept of uniform universe is wrong. We don't know, and this leads to all kinds of other ideas. Maybe we live only in one universe, and there are many other universes, multiverse. And uh, some of you are most familiar with the concept of anthropic principle, which means that the universe is the way it is. Otherwise, we would not be here to discuss it. So it has favorable conditions for our life. So back going to the details of, of, of the work we do, 
this is a simulation, it's not real data. The universe is expanding, that's, it was very young here, 0.2 giga years. And then as, as the universe expands, uh, I'm sorry, the lights are a bit weak here, but you can see that structure at the center becomes more prominent, and then you see this knot at the center, and even stronger later on. So gravity is non-democratic. A region which was slightly overdense gets denser. What we do as humble astronomers, we don't know what nature holds, what the secrets are. All we can do is observe. And what we do, we run simulations which have different ingredients of the universe. So you can have a universe with no dark energy, and you have one with dark energy. And you can have other funny models of gravity. And we run simulations either on a big computer or with a pencil and a paper. It's also a simulation. And we say, that's what our theory tells us. And that's what the data show. And which data set is the most, sorry, which of the models is the most compatible one with our data set? OK, so it's a data comparison exercise, as I'm sure many of the scientists in this room do in their own. There's a range of models, however bizarre they are. There's one universe, and we compare them. So that's what we do. This is the real universe um, uh, shown here. Uh, the, uh, the horizontally is our own Milky Way, and all these dots you see around is the luminous, mat luminous matter. So you can think of it as a Christmas tree, where you see the lights, but underneath are obviously is the dark matter everywhere, which we don't see. Uh, there have been quite a number of major surveys that mapped galaxies. In those, these type of maps, each dot you see, for example, at the bottom, you see blue dots. Each blue dot is a galaxy, like a Milky Way. And if you go march out from this, the Fox Center, it tells you the distance in light years, billions of light years. This is a big survey which mapped nearly a quarter million galaxies. I was involved in it for nearly a decade with uh, colleagues in Australia. And, and there are many other surveys going on. So all these maps, you see, they're dots. And each dot is, is a big galaxy. Uh, the uh, other aspect here is that those clustering, I showed you all these funny knots, and maybe it looks not so um, regular, right? The, no, different patches. If you look at this picture at the, at the center, um, you can see you don't see a particular feature. But it turns out if you analyze it statistically, there is a particular scale there which you can use. So nature is kind enough that when you do a particular mathematical operation called Fourier transform, you can pick up a scale which is about 150 millions of parsecs. It's a very big scale, but it has a fixed size painted on the sky in the distribution of galaxies. So this is this ruler. And if you use that ruler, you can then do geometry. It would just be like a little insect drawing a triangle on a sphere, figuring out it's a sphere because some of angles is uh, is smaller than 180 degrees, right? So we can do geometry. We can measure. We know the size of that feature. We can measure the angle. And we can then tell the geometry. And nature is even kinder because out there is the cosmic micro background, the echo of the Big Bang. And on that st structure is also a particular feature, which you cannot see here because it's a very small effect. But nevertheless, it's the same ruler. So we're extremely lucky to have rulers in different distances and we can work out the geometry. The cosmic micro background itself is extremely important. Uh, talking about the history, it was discovered almost by chance in 1965. So you probably all know, you know that there's this uh, echo of the Big Bang everywhere at 2.75 degrees above absolute zero. When you switch on your TV set, and uh, when you get a bit of snow as you switch between stations, 1% of that noise is the echo of the Big Bang. Think about it next time you switch on your TV. In 92, the Kobe satellite at the center discovered that there are fluctuations. There are tiny fluctuations, one part in 100,000. And then WMAP mapped it even better. And the latest is this satellite called Planck. And this is a, a new figure. You can see 2010 over there uh, off the sky. The blue stuff you see is on, uh, in our own galaxy. What we care about, the cosmologists care about the red part below and above. And there's already a full sky map and second in progress. So watch for this space. A lot is happening. There are these objects called supernovae. 
which are exploding stars. So here is one of them. If you look at the right, you see a galaxy there. It's very distant, so it looks a bit unimpressive. But then here is an exploding star, supernova. And those can be used as standard candles. Just as we use standard rulers, we can use like standard light bulbs to work it out. And you can see on the left-hand side the amount of dark energy, the amount of dark matter. And you can see in the smallest ellipse, the one in, in, in gray, that basically we converge in that solution of 75% dark energy and 25% in dark matter. And there's another technique. Um, uh, this is the Hubble Space Telescope on the left observing the sky. And I showed you earlier that light gets distorted under the influence of gravity. And using this technique, the tiny distortion of the images, we can actually uh, map the matter in between. And what you see, this feature, rather amorphous one, is actually what is probably distribution of dark matter that distorts images. Here is a diagram. What you see, I'm really sorry, it's not doing justice this, uh, with this le level of light. Um, let's see if we can slightly dim it. Uh, but what you see there, at the center is actually a, a, a diagram. It's actually a photo taken by the Hubble Tesco Space Telescope last week. So this is a project. Thank you. That's much better now. It's a project in which I'm involved. You're actually among the first to see it, actually. It's not been public, publicized anywhere. I got the permission from the team uh, to show it to you today. Now, if you've got very sharp eyes, you can probably see over there an arc. Can you see an arc there? This is due to, it's, it's an artifact, OK? It's a distant galaxy behind that lump of matter that gets distorted. And it generates a structure of an arc. So this was just measured last week, Hubble Space Telescope, and the team is busy analyzing it. Uh, a lot is happening in the world. Many, many projects of cosmic micro background and galaxies and so on. And in circles, you see projects in which our team is involved. So we have quite a lot of UCL involvement. In this short talk, I'll, for, I'll focus on one project, which is called the Dark Energy Survey. Now you know what dark energy is or what it's not. So this is a project gives you an idea. It's a $40 million project, uh, which aims to map and measure dark energy by a variety of techniques. You've seen some of them. I showed you supernovae, galaxy clustering, gravitational lensing. And this will start operating very soon. In fact, in October uh, this coming year, we start observing it. And it will measure 300 million uh, galaxies, 300 million galaxies. I was very fortunate very soon after I moved to UCL to get involved. And UCL has leadership roles. They're in both instrumentation and, and in the science. I showed you the group of cosmologists earlier on. There's also an instrumentation team, Peter Dole, David Brooks, and others who are involved, including students and postdocs. And in fact, what you see here is, is one of the lenses. There are five lenses which will go on a telescope in Chile uh, eventually. This is only a simulator of the telescope. Uh, but that's one of the five lenses. And the largest of them, which is not seen here, is a meter across, one of the largest in the world. Um, and uh, this was, uh, we were very fortunate to actually get support from our research council, STFC, when it had good days. And we got a bit of money. In fact, we were the first to bring in some money to this project. And, and um, it's all happening. And actually, two of the lenses are in the basement here at UCL. So eventually, all those lenses will get be installed, assembled, and be shipped to, to Chile. Uh, I'm nearly there, uh, Patricia. Uh, just to say, I, you're probably by now brainwashed with dark energy, just to say we can detect other things. And this is from trying to give you a flavor of the kind of work we do here. This was the PhD thesis of Sean Thomas and working together with Philippe Abdalla and myself. What we've actually done, we measure dark matter, but not the cold dark matter, but rather the neutrino mass. So there's this particle called neutrino, which we know exists. We know it exists, and now we know it has mass from other uh, types of studies. And actually, we managed to create a big catalog using statistical techniques uh, to derive the distance to, to the galaxies. 
And we put an upper limit of 0.28 EV, it's a funny unit, electron volt, on the sum of neutrinos, which is a very impressive number given that we know it cannot be, it must be larger than 0.05. Uh, and this made it to some of the news items in the summer, neutrino ghost particle sized up by astronomers. And what you can see in that picture on the right hand side, you would see um, a universe without neutrinos, which is more blobby. And on the left hand side, you'll see universe with neutrinos, which wash out the structure. So that's an example. Here are two models, and we have one universe, and we have to choose which is right. And we think that there are neutrinos there, but no more than that number. A dark energy survey, which will go into that telescope in Chile, we believe will measure it even more precisely down to a 0.1 EV. And I think it's already a more impressive number than what we get from what we might get from experiments on the ground, of course, they are also very important because that's a direct detection. So there's a crosstalk between astronomy and particle physics there. And if that's not sufficient, I told you Dark Energy Survey will observe starting October. But then what's beyond it? Well, it's not a bad idea to go beyond, above the atmosphere, right? Because the atmosphere is between us and the distant universe, and the atmosphere does all sort of, you know, nasty things, it's very romantic to look at, you know, stars twinkling, but in reality, it, this blurring of the atmosphere is a big headache for cosmologists, and we would like to get rid of it, and one way is just put yourself in a satellite. And this is a satellite which is called Euclid. It's a proposal to the European, South, uh, uh, European Space Agency. Uh, it is a program called Cosmic Vision. It was a top selected in one cycle. It's now being reviewed. And we at UCL are involved in it. It's purely named after the Greek geometer Euclid, absolutely after him. But if you've got sharp eyes, you'll see UCL in the name as well. So here's a cosmic coincidence that brings UCL into the forefront of cosmic vision. Um, and that's a summary. I hope I managed to give you in 30 minutes, I managed to, uh, I was trying to squeeze in a soft course we give in 33 hours uh, on cosmology here. Um, but the main message here is that uh, there's lots of observational data now, unlike in the old days that it was more of a metaphysics that you could just hypothesize. Now there are really data sets which eventually will have billions of galaxies. And what's remarkable is that these different data sets, cosmic microwave background, supernova, galaxies, and so on, coming together suggest actually there's agreement on the observations, but they all lead to a very bizarre universe. A bizarre universe uh, that, in fact, we, the stuff we are familiar with, myself and the desk and you, only 4% of the universe, and then about, uh, in total, about 20-something uh, percent in cold dark matter, and the remaining 75% 70 dark energy. So we would like to understand it. Or maybe we are completely fooled by nature, and it's not dark energy, but Einstein's theory needs modification. But I would only say that, apart from looking for a new paradigm shift, that this service would be extremely important for me measuring other things, because you get huge maps of the universe, and you can look at stars and galaxies and Milky Way. And I can only finish by saying, I wish I could guess what Christopher Wren would have said had he known about dark energy. Thank you very much. <laughs>